Okay, class, so here is uh, part two. I'm just going to continue on where I left off there. Um, and th let's go down. I just showed you the um, little, bit, little bit of uh, published research um, uh, that relates to this that's interesting to read. Um, let's go down here and talk about emotional capital traits. Um, we talk about emotional capital. Again, that's the capital that you have to know how to behave and how to use your emotional awareness to your advantage. Um, and the first one actually is emotional awareness, um, just being aware of situations um, that others might not be aware of gives some people the edge in terms of how um, to interact with other people. On this is a daily day to day basis, and it's so funny because you think about you know K through 12 and in the first couple years there in kindergarten and nursery school um, and first grade and second grade and and parents how they care about so much about you know how do they get along with other kids and. Everyone's thinking to themselves, why are they learning this in school? Well, it turns out that this emotional awareness trait is a huge predictor on how you'll do in life in terms of um, being able to bond with people and have meaningful relationships and also in the business world, being successful in the business world. Um, truly, everybody thinks that they can read other people emotionally, but yet there are people that are much, much better about being aware of what emotions are being expressed, what's appropriate, where another person might be coming from, uh, and these types of, of variables. Uh, perseverance, um, emotional capital being through perseverance. Um, again, these are high socioeconomic things that people learn. Emotional awareness is something that um, is cultivated much higher um, with privileged areas than underprivileged areas. Perseverance, uh, uh, perseverance, uh, perseverance rather, um, through trying times is a big thing too. Would do people just give up? Is there learned helplessness? Again, at higher socioeconomic status, people tend to hang in there longer. Um, internal locus of control. What I think I can do. I will do. I can get this done. It's all up to me to, to, to get this figured out. Uh, that's an emotional capital trait. Being optimistic is an emotional capital trait. And learning how to give and support, uh, give and take support from other people. Not just to give support, but to take support in a, in, a, in a good way also is an emotional capital trait that some people have and some people don't. And we see that people that are in higher socioeconomic status areas tend to have these a little bit better, and if not a lot better than lower and uh, low socioeconomic status areas. Um, again, let's go into social class with emotions then. Emotional resilience um, talks about one's ability to adapt to stressful situations or crises. More resilient people are able to roll with the punches and adapt to adversity without lasting difficulties. Uh, they don't freak out. They don't, you know, uh, you know, just absolutely give up or start blaming everything or become pessimistic or stop trying or stop getting along or stop, you know, socializing the right way or not doing their job that well. And we know people that we've worked with where um, they just look for any type of thing to just throw their hands up and give up with. And that's not a very good trait. Those people are not going to be as highly successful. Um, and that tends to be something that, again, happens a little bit more uh, in lower class and in middle to up, middle, middle and middle upper class tend to be very, very emotionally resilient. And upper, upper class, however, tend to have some difficulties with emotional resilience, interestingly enough. Um, it might be that they just want for nothing and they don't have to, 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 to deal with adversity too much. So they really don't know how to deal with it. Who knows? But um, we find that that's the, that's the pattern in, on it. Um, um, emotional resiliency and socioeconomic stats, we just talked about that. Um, uh, this is interesting, this little slide here, uh, subculture and emotions. And, and if you look at this chart, this is a pretty funny chart here, and this is kind of like young adulthood. And you look in here, and it's pretty stupid and hokey, but it's actually kind of interesting if you break it down. I don't know what this guy is. Um, but all these other ones, you can see, uh, you know, these types of fashions and styles being represented in one way or another. Um, and they're all very much subcultures. And, and yet, the values, the sensibilities that each one of these uh, subcultures represents are different. And so their emotionality is going to be, I mean, this, <laughs> this the, the punk, post-punk, punk era and stuff like that, the emotionality coming out of this is going to be different than this. It's going to be, and I don't know what this guy is again. I, some of this stuff I don't know. But um, so their emotional um, tool chest is going to be very, very much different based upon the subculture uh, that, that they're coming from. Um, their, their ethos, what's their perspective on reality? That's going to really change, um, you know, how functional or dysfunctional within society they, they'll tend to be. 
Um, and it's interesting because these are all very much subcultures uh, that you know that we see. Uh, and um, you know, this is if, if you, in case you didn't notice here, this is pretty much one ethnicity that's being re represented too. There's um, it's, it's very uh, white centric this picture, um, but. Uh, you know, you see very many subcultures being represented, and, and their ethos is the perspective on reality. You know, you ask each one of these people about the perspective on reality, and it's going to be a heck of a lot different than the person next to them. Um, but the ones that tend to jive more with um, uh, dominant ideology tend to do better in terms of moving ahead, which is interesting. Um, their language drives the emoting experience, how they choose to express themselves, you know, swear words, profanity, harshness. Um, love, um, the types of, of, of the endemic language, that, that language that, that they most frequently use is going to matter very, very much. Code of, contact, of conduct rather lead to unique style of, of, of face work, should be face work, not face time, emotional work and informal norms. Um, so their conduct's also going to mean what the what's kind of a conduct you're going to get out of this guy compared to we're getting out of this guy and this guy. It's going to be a lot different. It's going to be a big different tool chest of emotional uh, tools that you can go to in terms of how they identify right off the bat on a superficial way. It's the little thing up here, but we're not going to worry about that. I don't think too much. Um, this actually, this is actually is a slide where we're going to, you need to go back to the previous one here, but what cues did you rely on to label the previous subculture? Is there any accurate ways to access, is this an accurate way to access, uh, assess behavior? Um, should be assess, not access. Sorry guys. Is this a helpful way of understanding potential behavior? Um, so, uh, you know, again, I mean, the wrappings that people put themselves in, are they an accurate reflection of what's going on inside? Is it an indicator of anything that you could think about what their emotional context will be that when you have an interaction with them or not? Um, what's the point of wrapping yourself if it's not to convey a certain message that you want other people to see? Very interesting thing to, to consider. Um, do we not all have to wrap ourselves anyways around a culture? So do, don't we all pick a certain culture to mostly identify with? Um, fascinating to, to think about. Or if we don't, that that's another choice that we're making too. So. Um, how are we socialized uh, with emotions outside of, of culture, uh, uh, this concept of culture? Does broader society create emotional values, norms, and folkways and mores, etc.? Um, uh, well, my example here is an interesting one. I've got a quick story for you guys. I, um, I used to teach in seventh grade, and I had a student one time that was an A student, um, and she was tracked all the way through school, and everybody said, oh, she's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. She was in a computer class that I was teaching, and she got an F on a quiz. Um, when she earned the F, I didn't give it to her, and uh, she came up in, to me and started crying in the middle of class. And I said, hey, look, you got to stop crying. It's not appropriate in class. Um, and when I said that, of course, she started crying even more, uh, which was horrible. So I was like, look, this is becoming really disruptive. I'm going to send you outside the door um, to calm down. Sent her outside the door. She came back in. She was bawling even more. So I said, I'm going to send you to the office because the class is massively distracted right now. So it ends up that I... I uh, sent her down to the office for the whole period uh, kind of a punishment but also kind of kind of to cool down and the school um the parents called up and they were like what happened in school you know our, our perfect child what did she do there's no way she never does anything got all mad at me and it was an interesting thing and and we had a meeting with the vice principal and and i said look crying is unacceptable um you know just as aggression is unacceptable in class so is crying because it's an inappropriate mismanagement of emotions that's causing other people to have to adjust to their needs. It's very manipulative. It's very myopic. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Uh, this is a way of doing it, and this is a way of doing it. It just it seems that there's a gender exception for one and not the other. And you know, and when you get older, you're not going to be able to cry when you're working for IBM or you're going to get fired. Um, and so it was a fascinating thing to see that there are some so you know, so socialization processes that we do accept over some and not others. Um, based upon just tradition and, and seeing you know things a certain way, um, there's a couple YouTube uh, videos on here uh, that I have, um, and uh, you can click on onto them. Um, they're they're, f they're really kind of cute, but I'll let you watch it on your own. She's so cute, but it's about teaching and modeling how the emotions we should feel um, you know come into play. 
Um, I got to finish this up here because we only got about five more minutes. But um, emotions through manners, manners through class. This is the kind of mantra that we kind of have figured out in, in the socialization process of emotions. You learn your emotions through manners, and you learn your manners through your class that you're in. Um, so why are manners one good measure of emotion? Well, I mean, it, it, you can read this and go down this, and this is kind of like an interesting little. Um, a historical lineage of of some of the manners table manners that we've had and I'll let you do this on your own but you can see that this these these type of things you know are are relegated to people of a high class that have a table first of all and utensils and food to eat and all that kind of stuff um, so learning how to eat food as a manner was uh, something that you gained through class and these manners you can work backwards on it too these manners also changed how you should express yourself so it turned out that people are more highly sophisticated in terms of their manners uh, and their code of conduct uh, the ones that are at a higher socioeconomic status I'll let you read that on your own um, gender and emotions modeling uh, assertion and support uh, for essays below um, so working class women's habitus is organized around the notion of respectability so um, you know I'll, I'll let you read this on your own too as well but this is just kind of a slide talking about uh, femininity and the classes um, and how they you know working class um, uh, and this is all from Skeggs um, and and uh, it was a, a very very widely published and heralded piece of work in 1997 it talks about how the working class um, um, and you know how women middle class and high class kind of developed their uh, sense of what they should do and shouldn't do emotionally I'll let you read that on your own um, you can pause it or you can go back to the other PowerPoint and look at this um, the last couple slides here are very very important Ar Arlie Hochschild, um she worked on measuring gender and this is emotional labor it's the last of the five worked on measuring gendered labor in the workplace at, for primary caregivers um, what she was talking about Arlie was talking about was um, this idea of emotion work that emotional management that you have to to, to um, really monitor your emotions uh, in certain jobs more than others and she really studied nurses and flight attendants and, and she really was saying how they really have to put on a happy face all the time and that, that this usually that this emotional management is something that more women in, in workplaces have to do when they're dealing with children being positive not getting angry at the children um, these kinds of things and she calls it surface acting and she compartmentalizes and and then she she also distinguished it from deep acting um, which which was kind of what um, C. Wright Mills was talking about it, what changes how you behave, this deep acting. Um, and uh, and then you might take it home to your private life, this emotional work, and then you're starting to be fake with the people in your life. And she was really studying nurses and flight attendants uh, in general. Um, I, you can watch videos on her and stuff. There's a couple of funny videos from Cambridge students talking about her. Um, but there's some other information about her. Um, emotional labor, the definitions here is emotional component of working, smiling, friendly, kind, courteous, done in exchange for wage, clip earning, uh, or I'm sorry, um, oh, this, this clip has bad, <laughs> bad, some bad words in it, but um, the, the, if you can watch it or not, it has a couple bad words, but um, tips are a big example of emotional component, emotional labor. Emotional labor as a commodity, again, you're selling that. It's very similar to C. Wright Mills. Capitalism sets feeling rules and deep acting leads on to alienation. We talked about that. Speed it speeds up alienation and exploitations. Um, there's a waiting, uh, I think I think this might be the waiting <laughs> scene uh, from that movie Waiting, where it talks about waiters and waitresses and what they have to deal with. She was very... Um, interested in in the gender of it all uh, but it's it's fascinating to see that there's uh, you know if you think about police officers in the military there's a lot of emotional work that men have to do as well in terms of uh, occupations that are dominated by men so that's kind of some of the criticism of Arlie Hochschild um, but that idea of emotional labor is a big big one um, so um, uh, I'm not gonna have you do this this one is you just want you don't have to worry about so Anyway, so that is our uh, emotions. Um, you can read it slower for yourself, um, but I hope that kind of helps you get uh, some ideas. You can do some uh, internet searches and get some um, um, augmenting information about Arlie Hochschild. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what we got for emotions. Um, very, very light week this week, uh, but interesting nonetheless. Enjoy the videos that you have on there, and, and good luck on the quiz.